Uh, so I need to make a claim right up front that I'm not Madam Gratitude. I'm not standing here as the Queen of Gratitude and I'm certainly not a gratitude expert. And when I'm in the staff room, um, a person might say to me, see, Kerry, I'm complaining as if I'm the custodian of their gratitude. So <laughs> just need to make, make it very clear that that's not me. But I want to start by acknowledging the Indigenous owners and custodians of this land, the Miwanana people. I express my gratitude to them for caring for and protecting this country and pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging, emerging. So I'm delighted to give the Tasmanian Peace Trust 2020 lecture. I'm delighted not just for the personal honour of this opportunity, but for the chance for gratitude itself to be acknowledged as crucial to peace, particularly at this time in this year that will be known for all time as a great disruptor and in, in so many ways a great disruptor to our peace, to life as we knew it. And yet there's also a time when we've seen gratitude come out of hiding and come out of the closet where it's been labelled as too new age or too religious or associated with indebtedness. And it's come out into uh, the expressions of gratitude for many people that we've dis discovered a new kind of value for, for example, health workers and teachers and uh, people who work in st stacking shelves and those who've been courageous on so-called frontline during the coronavirus, we've seen gratitude come out and be talked about <clears throat> very often in newspapers, etc. So it's starting to get new currency, which is really wonderful. But it's also been a time, I don't know for you, but for me it's been a time where I've been thinking about what I've taken for granted and looking at things that may not return ever again and to be thinking about what it is I need to do differently as a response to the big pandemic and the big awakening of this. And <clears throat> um, I think the most, the, the, a moral response for how we proceed from here is one of gratitude. <clears throat> Sorry, gratitude for what we've taken for granted so we don't take it for granted again. So I'd like to frame my talk today on a beautiful statement by Brother David Stendel Rast, and you probably know his wonderful uh, lecture, TED lectures on gratitude, which are famous around the world. He's a wonderful Benedictine monk who does a lot of work on the intersection between science and spirituality. And he, he says that a, a grateful living brings, a pla brings in place of greed, sharing, in place of oppression, respect, in place of violence, peace. Who does not long for a world of sharing, mutual respect and peace? Brother David says that where exploitation arises from greed, gratitude creates a sense of abundance. Where oppression arises from the need to be above and put others below you, gratitude creates a sense of self-sufficiency, of mutual support and equal respect for all. Where violence arises from fear that there will not be enough and of those who are different to ourselves, gratitude celebrates difference and generates the sense that there is more than enough for everyone. So wouldn't it be wonderful to envisage a world where there's no greed, oppression or violence? Like Brother David Stendel Rast, I'm a strong believer that a grateful life is a powerful way to achieve this, a path to deeper peace. In my past 25 years of researching gratitude, when I first started researching it, I was considered some kind of witch and it was very new age and now all of a sudden it's become very hip, so I'm, I'm kind of in, in the pocket now, but it wasn't the case when I first started researching and I was considered to be a, a real recalcitrant and I remember um, colleagues really alienating me and not wanting to sit with me because I was some kind of, you know, somebody who was doing weird things in teaching and learning and there was actually nothing written, not much written about the role of gratitude in teaching and learning then, but we've come a long way since that time. So no matter what the context uh, where I've done some research, like university and high school education, uh, teachers at all levels of education from primary to secondary to tertiary, school leaders, pre-service teachers, Indigenous educators, and even though I'm not sporty, I've also done some work with elite athletes and their coaches. 
And whichever, whichever context, a common theme that comes through in all my research is that when people from these contexts practice gratitude, they feel calmer and they feel more peaceful. So what is it about gratitude that can actually bring about calmness, can bring about this kind of peace? Well, on an individual level, what the research has shown, so there's been thousands of studies uh, that have come out in the last two decades on the role of gratitude. And what these studies have shown in the area of, clinic, of um, cognitive science and uh, neuroscience has been that gratitude can actually make us feel well. And when we feel well, we naturally feel more peaceful, don't we? So gratitude protects us against stress, uh, tra uh, trauma, depression and anxiety. And studies have shown that gratitude leads to a more refreshing sleep, improved heart health and immune health, and improves mood and lowers fatigue and may protect against burnout. So that's all very exciting research showing that when we're grateful, we feel better. And when we feel better, we naturally feel calmer. And that's what many of my research participants are saying. But I think um, there's more interest and more significance about the research that what, in, in what gratitude has to offer in terms of our relationships. So research has also shown that gratitude is essential for building and maintaining relationships. And my research is showing that the area where peace is, is actually destabilised the most is in the area of relationships. So man, no matter how much we're trying to find internal peace, if our relationships aren't working, that can actually be the thing that undermines it. And I want to talk today about how gratitude can actually really restore peace to relationships. Would that be good? Mm. I hope so. <laughs> Unless you're somebody who has a really wonderful life where there is no conflict, then you can just have a little sleep, a little snooze for the time being, and I'll keep on when it's time. So uh, in, in order for us to be able to contemplate the role of gratitude in the context of relationships, I want to invite you to be thinking about a notion of gratitude, which is about not only how it can make us feel good and serve our own purposes of making us feel well, which is really great, but more about how it can help us acknowledge what we receive from another person and how we can give back in some way. So for gratitude, gratitude for me, and in particular for it to have its social transformation and full role in our society, it's not just about what we're grateful for, but an awakening about how we can express that gratitude in some way. So... Uh, as, a, as a philosopher and self-appointed custodian of gratitude, I really want us to be thinking about a kind of gratitude where there's a giver and receiver and gift. And gratitude can awaken uh, um, in a wonderful way what we've received from another. And in that way, it helps us feel greater connection to, to other people, connection with something beyond ourselves. It awakens us to our sense of giftedness, and we connect with another or others who made this moment, this opportunity come into being. And when we, when we think, thank someone, they're really saying, I humbly recognise that without your gift, without who you are and what you've given me in this moment, I would not have this, I would not be this. So gra gratitude awakens us to what we receive from another person. And in that way, it helps us to feel more connected, more deeply connected to people around us and to our environment. And the wonderful thing about this is that we can just be eating some rice and be thinking about the people who, who grew the rice and who tilled the soil and who packed up the rice and got it to our table and who cooked the rice for us. So the moment we start eating gratitude, eating gratitude, <laughs> eating rice with a lot of awareness, we're connected to all those people. And, and because it awakens our connectedness, it also awakens our sense of dependence on other people. And as the sociologist George Simmel says, gratitude is the moral memory of humankind. And he says that if, if every grateful action which lingers on from good turns received in the past was suddenly eliminated, society, at least as we know it, would fall apart. And in many of the communities that I've been working in, society is, societies in those communities are falling apart because of the lack of gratitude. 
And it, in many instances, it's only gratitude that can actually bring a memory of what we've received from each other so that we can actually be feeling much more connected. And uh, the philosopher Emmanuel Levinas has argued that a sense of interconnectedness is required if we're to assume the radical responsibility for the other that is needed to make us act ethically and behave as a true human being. So I, I argue that this same radical responsibility is required if we're to save our planet. We'll be more motivated to do so if we feel our interconnectedness with our environment through acknowledging what we receive from nature and the need to give back. So my summary of this point is that gratitude's not just about, oh, I'm really great, grateful for Kunyani, for example, and looking out at the beautiful sky and seeing it and taking that in, that's wonderful. But gratitude doesn't become complete until we actually work towards saving it and doing something to express our gratitude to what it is that we're feeling grateful for. So it's gratitude, what we're grateful for, and then also how we're going to express this. But I also think there's an art to this gratitude. And I'm still learning the art of gratitude. I've become an art, an art student of gratitude. And it, there's, an, there's an art to this giving and receiving uh, process. And my research shows, for example, that more people, many people are better at giving and expressing gratitude than they are at receiving it. So it's much easier for us to actually take in, much easier for us to actually give and express our gratitude. But when somebody expresses gratitude to us, we can feel awkward and we can feel out of place or we can feel like we, it's our job and scoff it off. And for example, when I was working with these young athletes, when they came back from Rio, they really wanted to express gratitude to their coaches, but they didn't know how to do that because the coaches would just scoff it off and say, oh, it's, to, it's my job, or you're just sucking up to be selected next time. And so their gratitude had nowhere to go because the, they, the, the coaches themselves couldn't receive it. So if we want this cycle of giving and receiving to keep going on in our society, we really need to become good at both giving gratitude, but also really good at receiving gratitude. So, uh, so part of the art of, of uh, and, and just to give you an example of this also, where I really believe that things come grind to a halt in, in our organisations. So, for example, I was um, quite ill recently and I went to hospital because I had a really bad staph infection in the middle of shingles and I was really upset in the middle of an emergency and this wonderful nurse came and offered me a cup of tea and start, I started crying and thanking her for the cup of tea and she kind of really helped me t like turn a corner in terms of where I was. And then when I was leaving the emergency department, I really wanted to thank her and I could see her behind a screen and I said to the receptionist, can I just thank the nurse? And they said, oh no, we don't do that kind of thing here. So um, it's just our job. So that made me reflect, like, isn't it sad? Um, there's so much burnout in the medical profession, but if there's not a structure there where we can actually thank our medical practitioners and that they can receive this thanks, then the actual lovely energy that gratitude can give is, is absent. So another aspect of, uh, of the giving and receiving of gratitude and the art of gratitude is that we, uh, we give back without wanting anything in return. And that's really hard because we're used to living in this very exchange kind of society. And so, for example, when I'm working with principals and they decide they're going to uh, write gratitude letters to the parents and the parents don't write back or the parents don't thank them for those gratitude letters, they think their gratitude's failed because they haven't received anything back from them. And that's just really natural. But the nature of gratitude, the art of gratitude is that we just give for the sake of giving without wanting anything in return. And that's that's, you can see how that actually takes a lot of consciousness, doesn't it? And besides that, the, there's, there's a lot of um, ways in which we give and we offer, offer gratitude or the ways in which we, um, we, we express gratitude and we may not know the outcome. And for example, uh, Luanne Johnson in her book, Teaching Outside the Box, 
tells the story of a, of a person who ran a private detective agency and they asked 150 detectives in this agency, what's the most common thing that you are asked to investigate? And this detective, the, the outcome was that not that they wanted to look for people that were having affairs, which is what we would have thought, but actually teachers. So people have, have the, the most common um, exploration for this that people will pay for to be able to get a private detective is to actually research where they can find ex-teachers so they can go and thank them. Oh. So, yeah, it's pretty amazing, isn't it? Mm. So that's a really lovely example of how our gratitude lives on without us ever knowing it. And if there's any teachers in the room and you feel like people aren't thanking you, I'm sure you've got lots of stories where you meet, might meet someone in Coles or somewhere 10 years later and they go, oh, I just want to thank you because you're the one who did this and this. So you never know. And of course, there's also an art to gratitude when we feel exa exhausted or burnt out. And many teachers that I do work with go, oh, don't tell me that I've got to do gratitude as well as everything else I'm doing because I'm so burnt out and I feel like I've got nothing more to give. And at those times, it's really important that we acknowledge the receiving aspect of gratitude where we're just here to receive and we don't necessarily have to give back. So we just take in the gratitude that other people give us or just take in what we're grateful for and let that nurture us and fill our cup without feeling like we've got to go and give when we, don't feel, when we feel the opposite. And here self-gratitude plays a really important role because um, when, we're, when we're much better at giving gratitude to others than we are giving gratitude to ourselves and to never forget self-gratitude, which is all about acknowledging our strengths and acknowledging what, our, what we've achieved and giving back to ourselves, not just giving back to others. So there's times when the art of gratitude is not about how we give to others, but it's actually how we give to ourselves. And all of this, again, is related to peace because if we don't feel these filled up with gratitude, then our, our internal peace and our peace towards each other is really um, undermined. So there's also this basic human need to receive gratitude from others around us. And this is highlighted by a really wonderful social anthropologist called Margaret Visser, who's written a wonderful book called um, Thanks, the Rights and Rituals of Gratitude. And she explores the significance of the French word for gratitude, which is reconnaissance. And the origin of the word reconnaissance comes from old French word reconnaisseur, which is to recognise. So when we express gratitude by recognising the value or goodness in another person and by affirming how worthwhile they are, then we're doing this reconnaissance. Importantly, she argues that we can't uh, thrive as human beings without receiving this reconnaissance. And importantly, we can't give this to ourselves. It has to be given to us by another person. So she's arguing and my research is showing that many people in our society are not flourishing and they don't have peace because they're not receiving enough of this reconnaissance. And if there's anything that I could suggest that we take from this talk today, it's about recognising those people in our society who aren't flourishing and to think about ways in which we can truly recognise them and give back to them um, in, way, in, in helping them see how much we value them. But here, gratitude's really different to praise or positive acknowledgement. It's much more about, I have received this from you and how can I give back to you out of acknowledgement for what I have received? Praise and positive acknowledgement are very one-way processes, but gratitude is very much about this giving and receiving cycle. So Margaret Visser says that reconnaissance is so essential to our sense of belonging and our sense of identity and community that without, without receiving this reconnaissance, we can't thrive and we can't flourish as human beings. And I want to say today that we can't have peace because that need, that need to be recognised, be valued for who we are, is essential to our sense of peace and well-being. And we also need to consider the cultural differences when we're developing this art of gratitude because 
uh, in different cultures, gratitude is expressed differently and we need to come to know the other person well enough to be able to express this gratitude in a way that, that can be meaningful to them. So, for example, in many Indigenous cultures, there's not a word for gratitude because they just have this inherent sense of belonging and a sense of sharing and interdependence that they just think this expression of gratitude is whitefellas' business and they think it's really over the top that we need to be thanked all the time. So if you're working in a school, for example, you wouldn't necessarily thank the the student in the class, but that doesn't mean that they don't have a need for gratitude. There's just a different way of expressing that. So you would build a relationship if you're working in a in a country country in um, on country in somewhere in Australia where there was a, a an indigenous co um, community. You would come get to know the elder of that community first, and then go and thank that elder for that child, for what you're grateful for in that child. That's the appropriate way to give thanks in Indigenous cultures. So that's just one of many examples. In Maori culture, for example, um, they value humility much more than they do gratitude. So you, um, they don't like to be publicly thanked. So if you're, an, again, a teacher in a school with a Maori child, you wouldn't thank them publicly. You would take them outside the classroom and thank them privately. And that that sits better with them. So I want to talk now about um, when we forget gratitude. So just as George Simmel says that gratitude is a moral memory of humankind, John ba ba Baptiste Monsieur said that gratitude is a, me is a memory of the heart. And when we forget gratitude, we forget how to connect to another in a heartfelt way. So Quite a, often quite a significant destabiliser of our peace or the lack of peace stems from the conflict we have with others. And the reason why most of my research participants are saying that they feel deeper peace is because gratitude has given them a way back out of that conflict. And interestingly, when I was talking to a lot of teachers and other people who are working in public service, for example, during the pandemic, they were saying that the greatest relief they had by being able to work at home was that they didn't have to go, go to work and negotiate the difficult relationships. So their, their time at home was a lot more peaceful because they didn't have to work with other, um, with other people. They could just work alone. Working with other people is where the conflict and the lack of peace resides. So uh, I think that just as well, just as we feel hurt, when our gratitude is not acknowledged, we also feel hurt. We also feel a great discontent when we don't express gratitude where it's due. So we, we might have this sense of, oh, I should have thanked that person, but we can feel great discontent if we forget to do that. And there's no truer place for that than with our parents. So I had quite a, 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 a difficult relationship with my mother and it was one that was marked by a lot of ingratitude from me. And I also had a lot of um, sort of turbulence and conflict with her. And I realised that my lack of gratitude towards my mother was actually having a really big impact on my ability to feel grateful in a whole lot of areas in my life. So when I was researching gratitude and listening to my students effuse of gratitude towards their parents, I, I was kind of had a lightning bolt that maybe this is a reminder to me that I needed to express gratitude to my mother. So I wrote her a gratitude letter and um, about a week after writing that letter, uh, while I was writing that letter, I was tears were rolling down my cheeks because I, for the first time, I think, genuinely felt grateful to her. And I said, I really want to thank you for my life. I want to thank you for um, all the things that you've been giving me. And it was, a great, it was quite an emotional but heartfelt letter that I wrote to her and sent it to her. And then about a week later, we got together and for dinner and she hugged me and I really felt the warmth had re returned to a very dis difficult and distant relationship. And that was just through that gratitude letter. And she said that she felt calmer and better than she'd felt in many years from receiving that letter. And that taught me that one of the big destabilizers of our personal peace is the 
the, the difficult relationships we can often have with our parents. And it also, um, so now when I go in and work with uh, parents groups, I often postulate that one of the reasons why we might have difficult relationships with our children is because of the difficult relationships with our, pa our own parents. So instead of getting um, parents to do work with their children, the first thing I suggest is perhaps writing a gratitude letter to their own parents. And they're quite um, sort of shocked by that. But of course, I always use the same um, proviso that I use with all my gratitude work, which is that we can't necessarily, we have to be, have common sense around this and, and make sure that we do it in a way that's not like about inappropriate gratitude and gratitude that feels authentic to us and certainly not to be replacing something that was really traumatic with gratitude by putting this positive veneer over a negative situation. So the other thing I would like to suggest here is that we, in many ways, if we want to have gratitude in our schools to actually get our students to practice gratitude towards their parents. And the best way we can do that is to model that ourselves. So now I want to talk about another role that gratitude has in regards to peace. And it's probably the one that I feel has been uncovered for me in personally and in my research over these years. And that is the illuminating power of gratitude, where it shows us states which are the opposite of gratitude. So when we try to express gratitude, we're actually able to see where we don't feel great, grateful, don't we? So we can actually go into, um, we might sort of re realise, oh yes, I need to be grateful to this person. but. Um, when we try to be grateful to them, we realise how much resent resentment that we have towards them. So one of the biggest inhibitors to gratitude and the biggest inhibitors to our peace is the opposite of gratitude, which is resentment. So a really great philosopher called Robert Roberts, and I don't know why his mother called him Robert when his last name's Roberts, <laughs> but this really great philosopher says that um, where there is gratitude, you can't have resentment, and where there's resentment, you can't have gratitude because they both cancel each other out as states. And I think that gratitude plays a really important role to highlight our resentment so that we can do work on that to be able to find a way back to gratitude. So that doesn't mean that we don't have gratitude and resent resentment living, on, living inside us. Most of us do. But if we want to express genuine gratitude to someone, we first need to resolve our resentment. And that's much harder, isn't it? Like much easier to be thinking about, oh yes, I'm grateful for being alive. I'm grateful for this group of friends. They're my, my in crowd. And this group that I've kind of carefully pushed out to the out crowd, I'm just gonna leave them over there. But if we want to have world peace, we need to be thinking not just about the people that we feel really comfortable and no resentment to, we need to be also thinking about how we can attend to those people in our outer circle, don't we? One by one, only just going for the lower fruit first. <laughs> and there's a whole process here that I don't have time to talk about today, but I'm, I'm writing about that at the moment. So I'd just like to draw your attention to what gratitude, what, what resentment is. So resentment is, um, is, is, is the emotion of uh, shock and surprise and we've been deeply shocked by betrayal or somebody has made us feel inferior and we feel like the way to get back at them is to uh, get some kind of revenge and also we feel so shocked that, that the initial disappointment or anger stays stuck inside us and we can't move on. And so it ruminates and keeps us awake at night. And when we hear that person's name, it, it, it um, gets a trigger inside us where we just go, oh, no, not that person. And we choose not to go for a great holiday because that person might be going along. We choose not to go for, go for a great job because that person might be in the same job. So uh, th I think a really great way to bring us back to gratitude is to actually find ways of working on our resentment. So resent while resentment isolates people from one, other, one another, gratitude brings them closer into relationship as they think about what they've received and how they can give back. 
While resentment alienates, gratitude brings warmth, acceptance and love to relationships. While resentment drains energy as we, l we lament what's been taken away from us, gratitude energises us and opens us up not only to what we give but also what we receive. So each time we take a brave and courageous move out of resentment, relationship by relationship, we actually take a greater step towards gratitude. Because resentment is on one side and gratitude is on the other. So we often think about gratitude as, as um, waking up in the morning and being feeling really grateful to be alive and when we're really happy, etc. But I would also like to invite us to think about gratitude as taking a step, a conscious step out of resentment. And the first step that we need to take is to identify it and to be really honest with the fact that we do have resentment. And this is where gratitude has an illuminating power because it actually shows us where we have resentment. Because when we're trying to be grateful, we go, I can't do that with this person. So that's why it's, it's, it's very important to kind of be thinking about how we can actually address this. So from my experience, when the pandemic uh, began, there was a sense of both dread and hope. The hope was that this would wake the world up, wake ourselves up to what needs to change in our present lifestyle so we can be more grateful, take less for granted, look after each other and our planet more carefully and with more kindness and compassion. However, many lament that this has not happen happened and that Things seem, now that things seem to be less dangerous, at least in our little pocket of the little world, there's a tendency just to revert back to things as they were. And that's, that's, that's part of human nature, isn't it? We, when we feel so uncertain, we go towards what is certain. But this pattern of forgetting and going back to the old highlights just how vigilant we need to be in our steps towards personal change if we're going to generate a deeper peace both in ourselves, our communities and our countries. This is especially the case if we want to live a grateful life because there's a lot in our society, in who we are and how we have to be in our society that takes away from gratitude. We've just talked about resentment, but when we're busy, stressed, working in a situation where we feel entitled, where there's a lot of competition, where we ourselves feel ill or we're suffering a lot of adversity or loneliness or depression, we can actually be, um, it can actually be really going against our capacity to be grateful. So I argue that gratitude is something that we need to be constantly vigilant about because if we're not, we can actually lose our gratitude very quickly. I know that's what can happen for me. So it's helpful, therefore, to have gratitude as a practice. And a practice, gratitude practice is an action that's achievable, that we take up purposefully, mindfully, and with a good intention to give back without wanting to receive anything in return. So going back to that example of resentment, a gratitude practice would be that we just take one person, once again, low-lying fruit, not too difficult, and we work with that one person over a period of a couple of months, maybe it can take a whole year, and we work step by step by first of all identifying our resentment and building up our capacity for great moving towards gratitude with that person, and I know it's a big process, um, but if we're willing to take that up as a gratitude practice, we're actually able to achieve greater peace, I believe. So one of the most powerful gratitude practices that many of my research participants report on is that of greetings, and especially if they do this with a heartfelt smile. So, for example, many teachers who have been greeting students in the past have admitted that it's just robotic and they just do it because they have to do it or because it's just practice that you have to do. But when they start instilling that gratitude, that, those greetings with gratitude, they start to feel greater connectedness with their students and with, other, with their colleagues for the first time in a long time. And they report that it transforms relationships and brings about more peaceful classrooms. And when we go back to what Margaret Visser said about gratitude being important, the, the recognition being really important, we can see that when we have a heartfelt greeting with someone, we're truly recognising them. 
So the beauty of this finding for me has been that it's a really, really simple gratitude practice. And, you know, it's a really consistent gratitude, it's a really consistent finding where school after school, no matter what context, I ask them, what's the gratitude practice that has had the greatest effect? And they say, greetings. So this is really a really kind of neat finding for me because it shows that if we want to have peace, peace in our peace in ourselves, peace in our our world. It doesn't. It's not necessarily about taking really big steps, and it's not necessarily about big movements. It can be really small things, and especially if those small things, those everyday ways in which we connect with others, are missing, then the bigger things may not even make any sense, or may not have as great an impact. And the other thing is that it can be, it can make us, um, we, we often feel like we've got complex problems that we need to solve with complex solutions, but actually the simple solutions to complex problems might be where the solution, li solution lies. And I'd also like to suggest that there's an other, another area that requires our vigilance in creating cultures where, is where creating cultures where reconnaissance is the norm, where we create families and workplaces where we feel really deeply connected to each other, where we're actually willing to find ways of recognising people in ways that they can really feel it's meaningful, and that where we create cultures where resentment can't live. And one of the ways to do that is to think about every night, a really important reflective process is to think about, have I broken someone's expectations? Have I made them to feel inferior in some way? Because they're the two major causes of resentment. And if so, how can I rectify this tomorrow? So we would never knowingly do that. But if we can have at the top of our radar, have I made someone feel inferior? Have I broken their expectations? How can I address it? We all create peaceful families and a peaceful world. So in conclusion, my sincere hope is that we allow this year of great disruption to open us up to its lessons in how to live a more grateful life. Let us be ever vigilant of remembering gratitude and its powerful call to take less for granted to restore our relationships and to re recognise our own inherent beauty. Gratitude is indeed a path to creating a world of sharing, mutual respect and peace. Thank you very much. Um, does anyone have any questions they would like to ask Karen? Yes, Maggie. What actually yeah. prompted you? Uh, what prompted you, 25 years ago, to take up this uh, study of gratitude? Mm -hmm. Good question. <laughs> well, I was teaching philosophy at a university in Queensland, and I thought my all the students had to do the course, so it was in a, not a voluntary course, which is always problematic. And the students were paying quite a lot of money and they to do this course and they were coming from law and all different faculties and I thought they were really blessed to be studying great, like the great thinkers like Confucius and Buddha and Aristotle and Nietzsche and all these other great philosophers and, and I thought they were also really blessed to be studying at this particular university. And then they came, when they come into my classes though, they were full of complaint and resentment and dissatisfaction. And out of sheer frustration, after a couple of semesters trying to engage them and tr trying to get them going, and, and a lot of the other lecturers were complaining as well, I decided, I just said, you know, you, you could be, re you should be really grateful for what you have. And that started a conversation going and they wanted to know more about how they could be more grateful. And when I stopped and listened to them, I recognised that they actually didn't really know how to be engaged in their learning. And they certainly didn't know that their inner attitude of gratitude or resentment was actually impacting on that. So I just decided to, and then um, they started to really get more engaged in their learning. So it was from there, I just developed a whole pedagogy around gratitude and learning. Yeah. 
Kerry, I'm just wondering if you've got any insights on how you can um, bring gratitude into your life. If you're coming from a place of physical pain, great physical pain or emotional pain, uh, I think it would be much more difficult to find gratitude if you're coming from that state. Yeah, really great question. And I absolutely agree with you and I've experienced that myself when I had shingles recently and I, up until that point, I thought it was all mind over matter. <laughs> I thought, you know, you can just use your mind to be more grateful and I realised it's actually matter over mind where your physical state really influences your, your mental state. And what I had to discover in my own journey and I've worked with an oncologist um, in Sydney, we're doing a project together on the role of gratitude in end-of-life care for cancer patients. And both within that context and what you're talking about, I've, my, my, my theory is that if we're grateful for the things we can be grateful for and, and really build our gratitude just even in really small things, like I'm grateful for the love of my husband, I'm grateful for this in a small cup of tea, I'm grateful for my garden out the front and really feel that gratitude inside us. That it, the science shows that it really, really builds our resilience and helps us be more optimistic and positive just by filling ourselves with that. So I wouldn't try and be grateful for the cancer or for the things that we're finding it hard to be grateful for, but look for gratitude outside wherever we can find it and bring that inside us. Yeah. Yes. Kerry, that's absolutely spot on. Be grateful for the little things. And my mother, when she was dying, was very, very grateful that she got a new deathbed. But nobody had died in that. They still had the pla plastic oh. on. <laughs> she was over the moon. About that. Yeah. So the little things we we choose to find to be grateful for can be only limited by our imagination. Absolutely. And we can use our imagination to think of things we can be grateful for, and then all of a sudden they're there. We find them. There's always something to be grateful for. And I, what this uh, oncologist is showing me, has been showing me, is that his grateful patients have actually built up their gratitude over time. So before they got cancer, they were really had a lot of adversity and they were great, found gratitude in that adversity in the ways we're describing so that it became part of their character so that when uh, something really big hit, they were actually able to address that with gratitude because they'd built up their gratitude over time. Yeah. <laughs> yes. I feed uh, about eight horses most days and you go to uh, where they are and they are, you know, very anxious to see you because they're hungry. Um, and um, they're very grateful when you give them food. And because you realise that it is you that is doing this little thing for them, mm. you know, it does give me an immense amount of uh, gratification yeah. or gratitude that I'm able to do this little thing. Well, that's just an example, but, yeah. you know, I just found that. Yeah, that's wonderful. And it's a really lovely example of recognising that that's enough. You know, recognizing that it's not it's it, we it's deceptively um, simple and profound and really really effective. Mm -hmm. And for example, if teachers that I've worked with do similar things to you, like they just concentrate on being grateful for their children before they get in the car, and then the rest of the day is just full on into the classroom. Just that act of adding that gratitude and doing that consistently, it's enough to set the tone for the rest of the day. Mm -hmm. So it's not about holding gratitude or in ourselves all the time and beating ourselves up if we're not grateful. It's about those small things and really doing them regularly and building them up and, and just being grateful to ourselves for being able to be grateful, which is what I'm hearing from you. <laughs> yeah. Do you agree? Mm -hmm. Do you agree that it's enough? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Me up. Yeah, good. <laughs> Whatever sets us up is really good. <laughs> Kerry, I'm just thinking about um, 
um, radical acts of gratitude yeah. because peace building is such a can be such a um, challenging space when you're grappling with issues of justice seeking mm -hmm. um, and where the emotive layer I guess of connecting in with the motivations behind you know justice seeking or the motivations behind um, how you're working for peace can kind of you know you get those kind of fridges in that and yeah. I'm just thinking about if you if you have any examples of radical acts of gratitude mm -hmm. um, which might sometimes seem a bit paradoxical yeah. in its context great question I think well resentment is known as the emotion of justice so when we feel resentful we often feel and rightfully so and especially in those larger peace make conflict areas that I think you're talking about we often feel really justified to hold on to our resentment so the decision to not do that anymore and to adopt a different way of being given that we're the ones who've been hurt and we could be waiting around for other people to do the work and to do the apologising and to do the work in this area of peace. And we decide to take action rather than waiting for someone else to do that. And we're the ones who are choosing our state. They seem really radical to me because it's, it's, op it's actually counterintuitive, isn't it? And, and Nelson Mandela said... That, that resentment is like drinking someone else's poison, someone else's poison and hoping that it, that it, oh, what was it? Gra resentment is like drinking someone else's poison. So we, we think that by holding on to resentment, we're actually making the other person suffer, but the only person who's suffering is ourselves. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, um, and it's, 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 that's counterintuitive because we, we feel that we, if we give up our resentment, we're letting the other person off the hook. We're letting the other country off the hook by doing this radical other way of being because the normal, the, the, the logic in it is that we would be resentful. And there's a whole kind of um, pedagogy around that collective resentment, which makes resentment okay. So to put gratitude in, into any of that collective resentment as an alternative way of being is very radical, but very necessary for world peace, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Does that answer your question? Yeah. I love the, word, the notion of radical. <laughs> I think radical action's needed. <laughs> Yes. While you were saying that, I was just thinking of a couple of really interesting examples of conflicts that resolved in a different way than expected. And I feel sure I'd love to know how it transformed. But Nelson Mandela and his relationship with his jailers, mm. you know, there was a transformation that took place there that when he came out of that situation became the national leader, led to a resolution to that whole political system that could have gone really, really badly. Yes. The same thing with Janana Guzma also formed a relationship with his jokers that changed the way that the Timorese political change took place so that they didn't end up ultimately in a sort of conflictual relationship with Indonesia that could have been a lot worse. I mean, it was pretty terrible what the Indonesians did. Yes. But then instead of their cycling on with, you know, cycles of revenge and... Yeah. You know, it didn't turn out that way because he, he, he transformed through something and I'm sure gratitude played a part. I think you might know more about those two situations. Well, they're all examples of, even if it's not stated as gratitude, every time someone says, I'm not going to be resentful, I'm going to do something about this, even if it takes me a year, that's gratitude. Because it's loosening the hold of resentment and therefore making it easy for gratitude to enter, so that's a great, grateful action to me. All this, all the the examples that you gave, and the example that I really love as well is Viktor Frankl's work in *Man's Search for Meaning*, where he says that between stimulus and response is how we can choose. So, in the worst kind of atrocities, um, in, in the Nazi concentration camp, where he saw his sibling and and parent and others. It, the, the worst kind of atrocities, he recognised and he taught his Nazi captors 
and captives and the, the Nazi captives, the whole art of choosing. And I think gratitude awakens in, uh, in us, the word gratitude, when we think of it, can often go, oh, that's right, I can choose my response here. Just that word. Oh, where am I? Where's my gratitude? And just by being grateful, we actually awaken to, oh, I can choose differently. And in choosing gratitude rather than resentment, that's such a powerful form of agency. Mm. Yeah, and quite a radical one. <laughs> mm. All right, well, thank you so much. Okay. I'd like to call on Peter, who is one of our trustees. Something. This is just a small act of gratitude, <laughs> which I hope you can cope with. I'm sure I can cope with any act of gratitude. <laughs> thank you very much. So, thank you. Thank you. Yes. Thank you.